I'm Selena Wang, in for Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where you bring all of our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, big tech's back on Capitol Hill, and this time it's all about fighting online extremism. Did lawmakers get the answers they were after? Plus, Amazon narrows its list of top locations to build its second headquarters. With thousands of jobs and billions of dollars at stake, we'll catch you up on all the details. And payday time for Apple employees, thanks to the new U.S. tax law. This as Apple brings home hundreds of billions of dollars in overseas cash to the U.S. We have the story. And now to our lead. Amazon has narrowed the field for HQ2, its second proposed second headquarters in the U.S. 20 cities made the cut, among them New York, Boston, Chicago, Miami, and Austin. The project's expected to cost $5 billion and create 50,000 jobs. We caught up with our reporter for Amazon, Bloomberg Technology, Spencer Soper, along with Intello CEO, John Bischke. Intello applies intelligence to big data to help modern recruiters find, qualify, and acquire talent. I wouldn't read too much into the three areas around DC because Amazon is likely targeting uh, labor pools and sometimes and, and those very often cross geographic lines so even though th that, that could simply be amazon focusing that general area but it has to negotiate with different uh political uh groups because of just geographic boundaries uh, john i know your firm intello has really been digging into the biggest tech hubs in the country so what did you find and did many of them line up with what uh, amazon has released yeah, we looked at a lot of our data, which we have data on almost half a billion people in terms of their skills and their capabilities. And what you find is that a lot of the bigger cities like New York and Los Angeles tend to have the most candidates to pull from. But I also think when you look at the list, you've got a lot of proximity to universities. So for example, Pittsburgh being proximate to Carnegie Mellon, if you're looking for technology talent, that would be a relevant factor in the equation. And Amazon also received proposals from hundreds of locations. So what is that uh, process that they took to really narrow that down? Well, a lot of what they're thinking about as one of the world's fastest growing companies is what will happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So where do people increasingly want to live? They're going to factor in things like public transportation, cost of living. But, you know, I think it really breaks down at the end of the day to talent. And can they find enough talent in that location? Do people want to live there? What will the quality of life ultimately be? And Spencer, what characteristics do you think Amazon is really looking for here? We have a city ranging from New York to uh, even suburbs like Montgomery County. Yeah, I think the main thing is going to be size of labor pool and the right type of talent in that labor pool. Amazon churns through people. Uh, people typically last about three years or so at Amazon. So if you're talking about 50,000 employees, you have to account for churn and attrition through that 50,000. Spencer makes a great point there. I mean, what will it take to attract people to the city that they choose and where are they going to come from? Are they going to be Silicon Valley transplants, uh, organically grown? Well, I think this is why education and the university system are so important. You have so many people who are growing up in other parts of the country, and when they look at cost of living and they look at their hometown, they'd love to stay if there were enough jobs. And where you see a lot of people gravitate to the Bay Area or other more urban areas is because they perceive that their own hometown does not have the economic opportunity. So were Amazon to base HQ2 in a smaller city relative to some of the larger cities on the list, it would be a bet to say we're going to be able to keep keep the talent that is in that area there versus watching that talent leave and go to other places. One other thing I think that will factor into this is Amazon's focus on a diverse workforce. And so if you think about where there might be greater pools of diverse candidates, I think that will factor into the equation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Spencer, Amazon has received huge tax breaks to build its uh, delivery and warehouse systems across the country. So what sorts of benefits do you expect them to get uh, for this new headquarter? 
Well, if you think about the uh, warehouse jobs, those are generally lower skilled and lower paying. So it, it's going to be easier for uh, politicians trying to lure Amazon to justify even better deals. And this is huge. 50,000 jobs, compensa total compensation, including benefits in the $100,000 range. So these are, are a, a big, big economic impact. So whatever you saw for the warehouses, you can expect to see that and much more so for uh, for the uh, headquarters operation, which is trained professionals earning uh, good salaries and buying homes and, and a good economic ripple effect through that entire economy. And uh, John, speaking of the economic impact, Amazon has obviously completely transformed Seattle, brought great economic wealth, as well as some strains on the infrastructure and rising prices. So, I mean, what do you think this ultimately means for the chosen city? Well, I, I think it's huge because not only do you have the commitment that Amazon has made, like Spencer was saying, 50,000 relatively high paying jobs, but then it's the follow on effect. So Amazon will base their next headquarters there. You'll bring other companies, other innovation. It may be more appealing now to to live there, to go to school there. So I think it's huge. I think it's why you've seen so many mayors in so many of these cities go to great lengths to try to attract Amazon. They recognize that there are not 100 Amazons in the world right now. It's a much smaller number of companies that could have this sort of an impact on a, a specific region. That was Intello CEO John Bischke and Bloomberg Technology Spencer Soper. Coming up, Facebook had a lot to say on Capitol Hill this past Wednesday, but our next guest thinks it still has much more to come clean about that up next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can now listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. A story we're watching, Uber will begin limiting the time UK drivers can spend on the road to 10 hours a day. This is in response to regulatory health concerns about fatigue and exhaustion. Uber said that starting next week, it will require drivers to take a six hour break if they've worked for 10 consecutive hours. Now to enforce this compliance, workers will be prevented from logging into the app during these rest periods. Meantime, Ford is warning that profit will fall this year as CEO Jim Hackett spends heavily to catch up with rivals to bring electric vehicles to market. Wall Street had been expecting a drop, but the company's guidance is worse than what even analysts were anticipating. The automaker kicked off the Detroit Auto Show this week by pledging to invest $11 billion to bring 40 electrified vehicles to the market by 2022. Representatives from Facebook, YouTube and Twitter were on Capitol Hill once again this week, but this time to testify about how they're fighting online extremism. They appeared along with a former FBI agent before the Senate Commerce Committee, and they were pressed again on a lot of the same topics that came up during last year's hearings on Russian interference in the U.S. presidential election. But perhaps the most dire warning came from big tech came from Senator John Tester of Montana. This is a really important issue. I just want to just say this is a really important issue from a terrorist standpoint, from all the questions that were asked before. But our democracy is at risk here. We've got to figure out how to get this done and get it done right and get it done very quickly. Or we may not have a democracy to have you guys up to hear you out. In response, Facebook's head of product policy and counterterrorism touted the media giant's efforts. We now have more than 7,500 people who are working to review terror content and other potential violations. We have 180 people who are focused specifically on countering terrorism. Now, Facebook's efforts against online extremism aren't the only thing the company is having to defend lately. The very nature of their business is being questioned, and our next guest called them a, quote, living, breathing crime scene for what happened to the 2016 election. Tristan Harris is a former design ethicist for Google and has been called the closest thing Silicon Valley has had to a conscience by The Atlantic magazine. They've unleashed Pandora's box. They have five million advertisers Facebook has cycling through the network every single day. There's no way to check 
uh, what five million advertisers, how they get matched at, at hyper micro targeted you know, uh, characteristics to each individual user. There's billions of channels basically on the new TV. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to basically know or be accountable to, to all of that complexity. So they've, they've unleashed this, this civilization scale mind control machine that they don't even know what thoughts it's pushing into two billion people's minds. As Roger likes to say, uh, two billion people use Facebook. That's more than the number of followers of Christianity. 1.5 billion people use YouTube. That's more than the number of followers of Islam. And these products have that much daily influence over that many people's thoughts. It, it certainly is massive. What do you think of the changes Facebook recently announced about focusing more on friends and content from family in the newsfeed as opposed to news? Well, it's a step in the right direction. And, um, you know, Zuckerberg titled his post when he said that as we are embracing time well spent as the future of the direction of the company, both in his recent post and also in the recent earnings call. That concept came from uh, myself and, and my colleague Joe Edelman. We've been incubating the concept of time well spent and calling out the problems of a time spent based economy for the last five years. So I think in, in, it's great that they're embracing the concept, but the real challenge is it goes against the advertising based business model. You can't ask someone whose entire stock price has been dependent on telling Wall Street that we have this many minutes of people's days. It's just a multiplication. This many minutes times the average ad rates and you get the revenue, right? So if they're going to say we're going to cut down on how much time people spend, I mean they can do a tiny bit but not that much. And so the real question is are they willing to examine the business model? You've called Facebook a living, breathing crime scene for what happened in the 2016 election. That is a, a bold claim. Yep. What do you mean? Well, uh, the point is that no one actually has access to what happened in the election. Only Facebook has that data. Mm -hmm. And so now the question becomes, well, can we trust Facebook with telling us the truth? Well, if you look back at what they've said since literally a year ago when first Mark Zuckerberg said it's a crazy idea that fake news had any impact on the election, and then them continuing to withhold and delay and defer the, the release of information, first saying, oh, it was $100,000 in ads, but then as Roger and I and many other, you know, there's a lot of researchers like Rene Direst and others at Data for Democracy that did lots of background research finding that the, the Russia campaign influenced 150 million people. And Facebook did not admit that until the day of the November 1st hearings. So if, we're, if, we're, if they're telling us that we should trust them to self-regulate, they don't really, they've not really won our trust. And so in that way, it's a living, breathing crime scene. Now, you first started calling attention to this when you were at Google. That's right. You worked there from 2012 to 2016, and, and you wrote uh, the first Google memo, and, yeah. and you sent something within the company. What were you raising alarm bells about? And what was the response? Well, basically what I said in this memo in 2013 was, um, you know, I was a product manager. I was actually feeling kind of frustrated that I didn't think we were taking our responsibility seriously. And I made a presentation, basically said, never before in history have 50 engineers, 20 to 30 years old, living in San Francisco, where we are right now, influenced what a billion people are thinking and doing with their time and, and their attention. And we've enabled this channel that's exploiting people's cognitive biases. It's, we're exploiting people's psychology. And we as Google, not as small little startups that are going to fix the problem, but Google and other large technology companies have a moral responsibility in addressing this problem. And the presentation went viral. It spread to you know, 20,000 people. It became the number one meme in the internal culture tracking system. And I had a talk with Larry. And um, I ended up working on this topic ever since 2013. And it was, it was way before all this stuff about fake news and elections and everything else. It was just an awareness that these technology companies have a larger influence on culture, elections, children's development um, than, than almost any other actor, political actor. And so, you know, how do we start to have that conversation and actually ethically you know, manipulate or ca be careful about how we're steering two billion people's thoughts. How did Larry respond? Uh, you know, I think across the company there is a uh, a real seriousness in taking to heart the message that people take. You know, I think Google's actually a very ethical company. They really do have good intentions. And the real elephant in the room is the business model. The advertising-based business model means all of these attention-based companies, so YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, um, Facebook, are all in the business of capturing people's attention. And you know, YouTube stated goals were how do we get billions of hours watching, you know, watching on this on this product for as long as possible. Did he acknowledge that? I mean, did he share your views or sympathize with your views? Uh, I don't recall specifically in the meeting with Larry, but I mean, I think that uh, it, it's never 
it, the conversation likes to get avoided because it's an uncomfortable thing to look at. Usually it's sort of an innocuous thing. I mean, I remember the Chrome web browser started measuring how much time people spend in the web browser because they just wanted to know how much time are people spending on the web versus in apps. It's a useful thing to know. But as soon as you start measuring how much time people spend in the web browser, suddenly all these young 20-year-olds start going to work and trying to maximize how much time people spend on the web. Mm -hmm. And so you, know, you manage what you measure. And we have to ask ourselves, what do we actually care about? Should these products be designed for addiction, which is what they're designed for now? And this has huge public health consequences for children. What are the consequences? Well, that, that, I, we, were, we had Jim Steyer of Common Sense Media on the show yesterday, and there really isn't a lot of research on how tech impacts children, shockingly, uh, given that there's so much concern about it, but we actually don't know. Well, there's a great article by Gene Twenge uh, that got a lot of traction called Have, we, have, have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? And it talks about many of the cultural and social impacts of how addiction to smartphones have changed uh, our relationship, uh, changed children's relationship and the children's dynamics. When are they having sex? When are they going out? Um, people are more isolated, more depressed. And if you just look at the dynamics, Snapchat, for example, puts the number of days in a row that you sent a message as a kid to all of your friends. And they're inventing this number. It's a persuasive, manipulative design technique to keep two kids on the hook, to keep this ball getting tossed back and forth every day. If they stop throwing the ball back and forth, they lose the number. And so kids start defining the currency of their friendship based on whether they're sending this empty message back and forth. And so you have literally, Snapchat's the number one way for teenagers in the US to communicate. So you have 100 million teenagers that are basically out there throwing empty messages back and forth. Is any of this designed to help us, or is this just to addict us? Well, it's interesting you mentioned Gene's article in The Atlantic, because I remember reading that. And also remember, th there really was no stand taken. Um, you know, it was it's fairly, in my opinion, fairly neutral. Yeah. Um, in part, I think, because we don't have a lot of the answers here. Well, I, I think what we can know is the motivations. Mm -hmm. If you look at what do thousands of engineers at Facebook go to work to do every day? Do thousands of people wake up and say, gosh, how can we strengthen the public square? <laughs> no. Thousands of people go to work, ask to, to drive up one number, which is how much are people engaging with and increasing the time they spend on these services. I want to live in a world where the tech industry is actually about helping humanity. And there's a lot of ways they can do that. And so we started this nonprofit, Time Well Spent, that's basically about changing the, and realigning technology with human values and what technology is supposed to be for. Why in the world would we not have it be that way? Have you heard from Facebook? Have you heard from Mark or Cheryl or, <laughs> or Google? Um, you know, uh, I've, I've had lots of conversations. And there's people in the industry are my friends. My friends started Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a, a reluctance, and there has been a reluctance to admit the extent of the scope of the problem and that the business model is the problem. And um, you know, I think there's a lot of good intentions, but until we get clear that the business model of advertising is fundamentally misaligned with democracy. If the business model is I have to capture your attention, that means it's better for me to, give you, to confirm your worldview and give you things that agree with what you're thinking than to show you things that disagree. I'll do worse in the attention economy if I show that reality is more complicated or different than how you think it is. Does a subscription model for Facebook eliminate all these conflicts? Well, certainly it would change who the customer is. If, if all of us are paying for the product, then you have thousands of engineers who's, who go to work every day. And who, who are they working for? They're working for us, for people who pay. What about the people who can't afford the subscription? So this is if really the idea interesting. Is to really level the world's playing field. That's right, and that's what they'll say. They say, do you want to introduce an inequality in the system where only some people can afford to pay? And I think the challenge is actually that the advertising business model has indebted us to a whole bunch of cultural externalities. So we have to ask, how much does those, do those cultural externalities actually cost us? How much does it cost us in terms of extra data plan usage? For example, is, is the free business model really free? If you add up all of the costs mm -hmm. to society and to our data plans and all this other stuff, I mean, half of the stuff that we download on our phones is probably ads. So if you just cut that out mm -hmm. and you actually had all these people, I mean, we would save a lot of money as consumers as well. And I think we have to figure out, what is that price point and what are we willing to pay for? That was Tristan Harris, former design ethicist at Google. Coming up, a cryptocurrency crunch. Bitcoin falls below $10,000 and has the bubble burst. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.
Bitcoin continued its tumble at the start of the year, falling below $10,000 this week after hitting a record high a little more than a month ago. The sell-off this week brings more trauma to a digital coin market that's lost more than $300 billion in value in just four days. It also comes after a dizzying rally that pushed Bitcoin higher by 1,400% last year. Emily Chang caught up with Spencer Bogart, partner at Blockchain Capital, to discuss. So there's a couple different ways to frame this. One is just what you said, that the market's down 50% from its all-time highs. And the other way to frame this is that it's up 1,000% over the past year, right? So when we talk about a correction here, really all we've done is gone back to the all-time highs that we set only six weeks ago. So it hasn't been much of a correction yet, at least not in comparison to some historical corrections. I want you to take a look at a chart, G hashtag BTV7721, which uh, shows uh, some perspective on Bitcoin slide. So you see the run up, as you pointed out, and you also see the fall. You know, where do you think this is going? I, I mean, yeah. are we coming back to Earth? Is this yeah. reality? Yeah, I think there's really two different sides of the story here. So first, there's the Bitcoin side, right? And I think if we try and think about what's going on in the market today, it really makes sense in the context of there was a lot of speculative activity leading up to the launch of these derivatives and futures products that should lead to the institutionalization of Bitcoin. And so I think that that was kind of a sell the news type of event. And some of those speculators that piled in beforehand exited their positions, driving price a bit lower. Now, that said, some people were expecting these institutions to enter the market and come bulging out of the gate. And in reality, institutions move in a scale more of years, not weeks or days, right? So I still think that that story is going to materialize and it will push Bitcoin higher, but it might take a couple months. So do you think we're in a Bitcoin bubble or that a Bitcoin bubble is popping right now? You know, I don't think that we're in a Bitcoin bubble over the next three years. I mean, if price goes lower from here, then certainly we will call it a bubble, right? We'll look at the all-time highs over 20,000, and we'll look at it being lower, and we'll say that it was a bubble. But I think that if we look and we see it high th higher three years from now, we'll say that it wasn't really much of a bubble. Now, you invest in blockchain-focused companies. So how is this impacting the investing landscape? What's coming across your desk, and how mm -hmm. enthusiastic? Or is it changing your level of enthusiasm? Yeah, so we're a venture firm overall, so we have really long duration in all of our positions. So it's not affecting us a lot. We can be really patient with this market. So we had actually already taken a little bit of money off the table, and we're holding a little bit of dry powder. So as the market goes down, we can always buy back into some of the positions that we really like and at cheaper prices. And we'll certainly do that when, it, when the time's right. So what kind of positions do you like right now? What are you... <laughs> optimistic about you know what whenever the market's going down I certainly like Bitcoin it's the most resilient out of all the crypto assets that are out there and a lot of times when you see a down market in these assets it doesn't rotate all the way back to USD to fiat currency a lot of it stays trapped in the ecosystem and their flight to safety is actually Bitcoin so while most investors consider Bitcoin to be very far out in the risk spectrum within the crypto community this is viewed as the safe haven what about some of the smaller assets? Mm. What are you most excited about? What yeah. is the next Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. Well, for one, I think that some of the smaller assets could have a lot further to go down. I mean, a lot of these coins are valued at hundreds of millions of dollars, and they haven't released any kind of a product yet. And how do we explain those kind of valuations and those kind of price moves? You can't. Uh, I, I think that overall, well, I think we can, actually. I think that largely it's because seed stage investing and early stage investing has been romanticized a lot over the past couple decades people hear about these stories of people being a seed investor in an uber and that's an opportunity that most investors have not had access to all of a sudden in the crypto market these icos have created a new opportunity for retail investors to participate for the first time and how did they react to that they were like kids in a candy store right going wild and i think that now a lot of those people are learning the hard lesson which is that with early stage investing failure rates are very very high and we're seeing the flip side of that coin. So I'm curious, in, in your job, are you waking up every morning and checking the price and going, ah, or yes? I mean, is that yeah. it, is it that sort of volatile Look, you know, I, yeah. in, your, in your own workplace? It is. I mean, we're definitely watching it. We're not so emotionally tied to it because we are very long-term investors. The day-to-day the -day moves really don't matter that much to us. But that said, I but think... But this is a big move in a matter of weeks. It is a big move. And I think that overall, it's healthy for the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Forest fires are healthy for the long-term sustainable growth of an ecosystem. And I think that's what we're seeing here. A lot of people rushed in over the past three months because they thought there was easy money in this market. There was free money. And they underestimated the risk involved. And I think this is actually a healthy reminder if not a painful lesson about the level of risk involved in these markets. That was blockchain capital Spencer Bogart. Coming up, Apple plans to bring back billions. All of the details on the tech titans repatriated cash up next. Plus, a new report by an advocacy group describes hazardous working conditions at an Apple supplier parts in China. We'll head to Asia to dig into the latest. This is Bloomberg.
welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Selena Wang, in for Emily Chang. This week, we reported that Apple will return hundreds of billions of dollars in overseas cash to the U.S. In a statement out on Wednesday, the company says it will pay $38 billion in repatriation tax. Apple also plans on investing tens of billions on domestic jobs, manufacturing, and data centers in the coming years and give its employees a $2,500 bonus after the new tax law. Emily Chang caught up with Bloomberg's technology's Alex Webb, who covers all things Apple. Well, they've said they'll spend the $30 billion in the U.S. on a new campus, which will be for technical support. They've already got one of these in Austin. It's clearly not something that's very easy to do in, say, China. So it's a, a sort of job that has to be done in the U.S. Um, you know, for telephone calls and that sort of thing. So how many jobs might that create? They've said they'll create as many as 20,000 jobs. That's clearly quite good news from a political perspective. But um, at that, given they have 84,000 employees already, it's quite a big bump. But one caveat, that's over five years. Okay, so you know, what else does this mean? The thing that's kind of interesting, actually, if you, if you really look at the numbers, the big number that they want everybody to talk about is they're going to spend $350 billion in the U.S. over the next five years. The odds are they were going to spend most of that money already. Mm. The new money is the $38 billion for the tax um, bill and $30 billion to spend on the U.S. Now, if you subtract that from the $252 billion they have offshore at the moment, they've still got a huge pile of cash, and that's what shareholders are going to be really excited about in terms of buybacks and dividends. Right. So what happens to that? the rest of that cash that currently remains overseas? So the, basically, there are three ways they can use it. Yes. Buybacks, still shareholder returns, M&A, um, and um, repayment of debt. They've got over $100 billion in debt. Does Apple have a track record of spending a lot of money on M&A? No. Could they have probably spent big on M&A by raising debt? Almost definitely yes. So I think, broadly speaking, the expectation is that a lot of this money goes back to shareholders. Well, you know, what is the indication on the the M&A strategy? Obviously, we know the biggest company they've ever bought is Beats. That was a three billion dollar acquisition. We've seen them make some moves in music streaming. They bought Shazam. You know, do we think they are leaning towards making more acquisitions? And if so, what kind? I mean, I did a piece about this a little while ago. Generally, the sense in within Apple is they're quite risk averse. They've right. looked at people like Microsoft, who did a massive deal to acquire Nokia a few years ago and had to write down almost the whole thing. So Apple also has the sense that, well, you know, we've got a lot of money. We can use that money to spend on R&D and anything that other people might be able to do, we can do internally. There's a sense maybe the things they're interested in are content because they want to build out that services business and semiconductors, chips. We we know they tried to, they express an interest in acquiring an imagination technology as a chip maker, for instance. And so there are certain moves they've made which indicate that's an area of interest. How does this position Apple with respect to, you know, the, 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 the wider climate and what's happening with the administration? Well, it's interesting. There's not been any response from Trump just yet, um, which well, we'll be waiting for that. But I, I'm sure that he will jump on this as a, as a sort of way of underscoring what he has posited. His huge campaign pledge was bring more jobs back to the U.S. Apple, of course, employed millions of, well, several hundred thousand people at least in China indirectly through its supply chain. And so the fact they're bringing jobs here is a kind of a plus point in the polit political ledger book. That was Bloomberg Technologies' Alex Webb. Meantime, one of Apple's largest Chinese suppliers is getting slammed for the harsh working conditions that its workers have to endure. The main manufacturer for the iPhone's distinctive brush metal casings, Catcher Technology, is under scrutiny after a rights group found violations on its factory floor. Bloomberg's managing editor for Asia Technology, Peter Elstrom, joined us from Tokyo with the latest. It's important to note, uh, yes, there is a report out from China Labor Watch. Uh, in addition to that, we sent uh, Bloomberg News reporters to the factory to interview workers ahead of this report coming out. And they described uh, quite harsh conditions uh, that they're working under. They talk about standing up for 10 hours, sometimes straight up to 10 hours straight uh, in hot factory conditions uh, as they work on these uh, iPhone casings uh, with loud noises. And sometimes they say they don't have the proper equipment, including uh, masks and gloves gloves, in some cases, uh, earplugs. Uh, so they talk about the difficulties there. Uh, they also talk about if you're a bit claustrophobic, they say that there are hundreds of workers working in this factory and the door only opens about 12 inches, uh, which makes it difficult to get in and out uh, quickly. Uh, and our reporter was able to visit their dorms too to see the living conditions there, which were quite difficult. They're very cramped. Uh, many workers jammed into small rooms, no showers there. In fact, no hot water at all also. So it's a quite uh, difficult situation uh, for these workers and um, 
and they talked about how they've asked for some of these protections and haven't been able to get them. And when it come to, comes to safety training, they say they're supposed to be getting 24 hours of training before they begin working at the factory. And in some cases, they're forced to sign off on the paperwork before they finish all that training. Uh, in some cases, getting only an hour of training. The door only opens 12 inches. I mean, you know, how do these kinds of uh, descriptions compare to what we've heard about Apple suppliers in the past, which, you know, hasn't always been uh, the most glowing reviews of the conditions that, you know, workers at Han Hai, for example, have to endure? That's right. Yeah, to be fair, Apple has worked hard at addressing uh, these kinds of labor issues in its supply chain. Uh, back in 2010, there was a rash of suicides at Han Hai, as you're mentioning, uh, the primary partner for making the iPhone. And Apple took actions to try to address that. Uh, Han Hai also did. They, um, they set up counseling services for some of these workers. They provided 24-hour uh, hotlines to be able to call in any kind of issues. And they also set up nets around the factories to stop some of these suicides. So they have worked hard at this. Apple itself has begun putting out these annual supplier reports talking about their supplier responsibilities. They said last year they did more audits than ever before where they went out to the factories and did complete site audits. They did more than 700 of those. So they are addressing this. It's important to note though, of course, you outsource your manufacturing to be able to save money, make higher profits for your shareholders. So that's part of the business model. Right. You know, how do, what do we know about, uh, Apple gets a lot of attention, of course, but what do we know about how these conditions compare to uh, suppliers for other electronics companies? It is an ongoing issue in China. And as mentioned, uh, Apple and its supply chain have been working hard at trying to address these issues and make the conditions better for their workers. There are ongoing challenges throughout China as they uh, take on this kind of high-tech manufacturing. These are considered some of the best jobs in the country, in fact. And the wages may not sound much. In this case, the workers were making a little bit more than $600 a month, uh, which works out to a little bit more than $2 an hour. It doesn't sound like that much, but in China, that's actually a reasonably healthy wage. It may sound low compared to, say, a $1,000 iPhone, uh, but it's, uh, it's relatively healthy. Bloomberg's Peter Elstrom there. Now coming up, the battle to save net neutrality is seeing U.S. states take legal action. We'll talk to one of the state attorneys generals leading that effort next. Plus, Uber board member and Thrive CEO Ariana Huffington, what she has to say about a potential Uber IPO ahead. This is Bloomberg. A story we're watching, Survey Monkey is said to be accelerating conversations with bankers to go public later this year. That's according to Recode. The company is expected to be closely watching how other tech companies fare in the market. Other Recode sources added that Survey Monkey is considering making a last minute bolt on acquisition of another company in the space to enhance its value. A group of 22 state attorney generals and several public interest groups are suing the FCC over its net neutrality decision. This is the latest motion in the ongoing battle over the future of the Internet. Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn spoke with one of the attorney generals leading the fight against the FCC. That's California AG Javier Becerra. Well, it's the beginning of a, what I hope is a fight that we can win because if we can't, then that means a lot of people in this country will no longer have access to that Internet the way they've expected it. We all want choices. We want, want, want the freedom to choose. And if you get rid of net neutrality, all of a sudden you go towards a system where the haves will have it all and those who are hardworking will get very little. Now, what about the idea that the president just signed an executive order to make it easier for companies to put broadband in rural areas? Is that taking the sting out of the tail a little bit? It won't work. Uh, because why would a company invest money in a rural area where you can't make that much money, there aren't too many people, instead of going into the uh, higher income areas of the country or the densely populated areas of the country? That's exactly why you need to have net neutrality. So there, there's no gaming of the system by the providers of the service. Uh, think in terms of water or even education, electricity. We don't tell companies that get to d dispense water or electricity or the places that get to provide education for our kids, you decide where you want to go based on money. 
we know where they'll go, where there's money, and they'll leave everyone else behind. Think, that, think in terms of old mm -hmm. mail service. In the rural areas, there would have been no mail service had it been based on money. Mr. Attorney General, what can you do more than this lawsuit to actually try to fight this rollback of net neutrality? For example, is it possible for you to take a case against an internet service provider that might be discriminating by providing a lower, lower speed service to some of its customers? Can you do that? We could continue to enforce our state laws. We could make sure that a company is not discriminating against communities. And we can work with our state legislature and our governor to make sure that we pass whatever laws we can in our state to make sure we have a ro robust regime of protections for consumers. And we are moving in all of those fronts because this is about not only providing people with choice and freedom to choose, but it's also about keeping California's economy moving forward. We're the economic and for the country. We're the sixth largest economy now in the world. Why would we want anyone to disrupt that? Who has been a bigger opponent of the FCC chairman's policies, would you say, the entertainment industry or the tech industry? Both. Uh, th th they uh, both understand the consequences of not having that access for consumers. If the choice is made by those who have money, who wield power, then those in the middle, the middle class, are the biggest losers because they don't have the financial leverage to try to attract the business their way. And they'll be left with the crumbs. You'll have different speeds of internet service. You'll have different choices in uh, the types of uh, media that you can look at or watch. Your kids, can you imagine your kids, if they use the, the internet to do their homework, there will be kids who have access to everything they need on the internet to do good, good work and uh, uh, excel in school. There will be vast numbers of kids who can't, whose parents can't afford that, and therefore they're going to be behind. Are you in conversation at all with any internet service providers in the state of California? Have you notified them that this will be the action you'll be taking? I've been working with a number of the internet service providers and those in the internet community overall for more than, uh, well, for the last year that I've been the Attorney General because California has been moving to try to do what it can to make sure that we move forward protecting our consumers before this action by the FCC. So we'll continue that conversation because we want our internet service providers, our companies here, to thrive. California is the innovator when it comes to the United States of America. We want uh, companies to locate in California. We want them to know that the innovation occurs here. We're ground zero for innovation. Uh, but we yeah. want people to know we want to do it for everyone. That was Javier Becerra, Attorney General of California. And it's not just attorney generals taking action against the FCC decision. Several consumer protection groups like Free Press and Public Knowledge are also taking legislative action, as well as the company Mozilla. Emily Chang spoke with the chief business and legal officer for Mozilla, Danell Dixon. From the, the standpoint of Mozilla and our mission, the notion is protecting the open internet as an, a global resource accessible to all. So we'd like to be able to reinstate those open internet principles, principles that we've all worked and lived under since the inception of the internet, uh, and to get that so that we can get all of us as consumers to have this act, this global resource available to us. Now, you know, others have complained about the world being rolled back, but you know, in some ways, it's a wonder we haven't seen stronger action from some of the tech giants. Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, uh, saying recently that net neutrality is still important, but it is not their priority right now. What do you make of that? Well, I, I don't know if that was taken out of context, but the notion is I think that most of the tech companies support usually through alliances. That's why it was really important to us to make a statement as a plaintiff mm -hmm. in this, as a petitioner, so that we can actually help to control the litigation. We really wanted to be a party here. So you say that ending net neutrality as we know it could end the internet as we know it. Why would that be such a bad thing? The internet isn't perfect. We were just had a very long conversation about how the internet isn't perfect. Yeah, the internet's not perfect, but it's it's this the notion of the internet and the way that it was set up is that we all had access to whatever information we want. I don't want to be alarmist, but think about a world where think about politics and the what if an ISP just believed a certain way with respect to a specific political issue and they blocked or they throttled all content regarding that uh, the other side of that issue so no one could get access to it it really could impact not just the way people think but it could impact our democracy it could impact the, the the way that the global world sees the US as well this is an issue and the and the internet is an issue that 
that no one country should regulate, and certainly no private entity should determine what content you get access to in your home. So how should we watch this play out? What are next steps? Well, the, the litigation will continue, and uh, I don't, we're, we have to see how that plays out. This is a, a longer process when you're in litigation. We see lots of legislative action right now. There's a CRA, there's votes in Congress um, to try to repeal and to try to roll back those, those orders. And we could see legislators themselves writing legislation to be able to, to, to formally uh, codify the open internet principles. So are you working with or speaking to other organizations that are considering filing lawsuits of their own? Oh, we've spoken with lots of our allies and lots of colleagues of ours outside that, that believe very strongly in this and have already joined. Some of them have joined. Some of them have said they're going to be interveners in the litigation. So we, um, there's a lot of folks out there that care about this issue and are going to fight just like we are. That was Danelle Dixon, Chief Legal Officer for Mozilla. Now still ahead, we catch up with Thrive Global CEO and Uber board member Ariana Huffington. What she has to say about Uber's current IPO plans and the Me Too movement. This is Bloomberg. Chinese video site startup backed by Tencent is trying to raise money at a $17 billion valuation. That's according to people familiar with the matter who say Kwaiso is targeting about a billion dollars of financing as it expands its video streaming service to Southeast Asia. The company is a video platform in a similar vein to Instagram and Periscope. Bloomberg sources are careful to note that no final agreements have been reached and the details of the deal could still change. Ariana Huffington's Thrive Global just launched an app available to, to those with the Samsung Note 8. The Thrive app hopes to offer a way to set boundaries with technology so you can connect more deeply with yourself and others. Emily Chang sat down with Huffington and we asked why we need an app to set boundaries. You would have thought we wouldn't need an app, but Emily, uh, there's been so much writing over the last few months about how addictive technology has become and how in fact deliberate that addiction is, how social media companies especially use algorithms, machine learning, to use likes and social um, feedback loops and dopamine hits to keep us hooked. So the app is like a coach, a guide to help us recalibrate our relationship with our phone. The two most important features are first, it's bi-directional. So if you are in thrive mode, because let's say you're having dinner with your family and I text you, I'll get a text back that says, Emily is in thrive mode until such and such a time which will both let your friends know that you are not ignoring them, you are just in thrive mode and not to be distracted. Uh, but also it will help change the culture. It will help change the cultural expectations. Right now the expectation is that we need to be always on. We need to respond to texts immediately. And uh, the second feature is uh, a dashboard that gives you a mirror of your social media consumption. So you have a partnership with Samsung now. When is it coming to the iPhone and what is the strategy for broader use here? So uh, it will come to the iPhone in the next six months. We're developing it right now. Um, we have a partnership with Samsung both for the app. It's now available on the Galaxy Note 8. But also we launched together a dedicated section on Thrive Global called hum Humanity and technology, which is all about this inflection point in our time. You know, Emily, it's become a big issue in Silicon Valley and beyond about what is technology doing to us. How much responsibility do you think uh, the platforms like Facebook bear and companies like Apple bear for tech addiction, if you will? Well, Apple and Facebook are different. If you sell hardware, um, you still have some responsibility to have features um, that can protect especially children from abuse of the phone. Uh, if you are a social media company, um, as you know, in the attention economy, social media companies are deliberately mining more and more of our attention because that's how um, they increase revenue and profits. So that's where it's going to be very important for social media companies 
to put the public interest ahead of revenue, which may seem like an impossible task, but we know now that unless they do that, the backlash is going to keep growing. Are there other changes that you think a company like Facebook should be making? I think basically looking at uh, what is the impact of constantly pushing notifications. Um, I don't know about you, but I have shut off all notifications except from friends. I don't want to know everybody likes a photo. I love Instagram, I love all the social media apps, but I also set clear limits to how much I use them and clear limits to how much I allow um, notifications, alerts, uh, um, etc., to be disturbing my life, you know, my ability to connect with my friends, uh, my colleagues, my ability to do deep work or simply to unplug and recharge. You remain in a major role on the Uber board. Now that the SoftBank deal is done, you know, what shape would you say the company is in under Dara's leadership? You know, when will they be appointing a board chair? Will the company be ready for an IPO next year? I think the company is in a really strong position. The SoftBank deal is incredibly important. Um, Uber will now have on its board Rajiv Misra, the CEO of the Vision Fund that, um, that led um, the new funding. And uh, what is so important is that SoftBank is at the center of the ride-hailing industry globally. So it's so great for, for Uber um, to have SoftBank now as a major investor. Um, Dara is doing an amazing job. The cultural values have been revamped. Um, tremendous progress in the last few months. He's hired a new COO, a new general counsel. Um, there is, a, there is a, an interviewing process for a new chairman. So um, I think everything is on track. And do you think an IPO could happen as early as next year? Well, already uh, Dara has said that the IPO will be in 2019 and, and there's nothing that has happened that will change that. Uh, you mentioned the new general counsel, Tony West. How is Tony doing so far? And do you think that Uber will continue to be dogged by these Justice Department investigations? Or, uh, you know, you know, how long will this sort of cloud be hanging over the company? I don't think it's a cloud hanging over the company. I think it's bringing everything to the surface um, to be dealt with. And at the same time, the company is doing uh, great things. It's not as if uh, um, these issues of what had happened in the past um, are dominating everything. The company is growing, uh, bringing in new major investment, bringing in great leadership talent. So. I think um, what's happening on the legal front um, is obviously necessary in order to deal with all these problems, but it's not uh, in any way consuming Dara. That was Thrive Global CEO and Uber board member Ariana Huffington. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We'll bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in each day at 5 p.m. New York and 2 p.m. in San Francisco. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays. And that's all for now. This is Bloomberg.